Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Renee Richards, and I'm part of the webinar uh, committee for the Women's Network um, for, C for SEG. I want to also thank Ming Wong and Shelley Oakley for their help today in organizing this talk. Uh, the WNC is seeking webinar talks for next year, so if you or someone you know would like to give a talk, please reach out to us. Uh, we appreciate your participation um, and the ability to bring talks like uh, the one we're going to listen to today to uh, members all around the world. So uh, we are excited to have uh, Whitney Trainer Giton speak today. She's a professor of geophysics from the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, following the talk, we will have a Q&A, so feel free to ask your questions in the chat box or wait until the end of the presentation to ask your questions. So uh, without further ado, Whitney. Thank you, Renee, and thank you to WNC. Um, I'm, uh, as Renee said, uh, currently a, a professor at Colorado School of Mines um, through the end of the month, and then uh, our family has actually brought you brought us to France. So I'm, I'm coming to you from France, uh, Po, France, to be exact. Um, but uh, this webinar is based on a graduate course uh, taught for the last three years at mine, so happy to be here to um, give it to a wider audience. All right. So a really quick introduction. Originally, I'm from um, South Central Idaho. Uh, was raised in Twin Falls on the south rim of the Snake River Canyon here, and that definitely played a role in my interest in the subsurface. You see the Snake River uh, aquifer coming outside of the canyon walls here. Um, and so I actually attended mines as an undergrad and got my undergraduate degree in geophysics. I had two years in the Peace Corps doing more sustainable agricultural um, work along with women's entrepreneurial um, support. And then I headed to a geostatistics research group known as SCRF or Standard, Stanford Center for Reservoir Forecasting. Um, and this uh, was where I worked a lot on what was known as value of information uh, methodologies. And so geostatistics is a, um, one of the great ways to assess uncertainty in space. Um, and that's what we have in a 3D subsurface and what geophysics is attempting to understand as well. Uh, after that, I um, started doing uh, kind of extended my value of information methodologies to geothermal and CO2 sequestration applications at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And then um, that's where I had my two girls. Everyone likes to show off their um, photos of their kids. And I like to do this in presentations as kind of solidarity with you other working parents. Um, and we know the struggle. <laughs> um, so I'm sometimes after uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab where I've been leading a, um, a small research group which we call ourselves data to decisions um, and so many of my students are working on a variety of topics um, but most of them are all connected to each other via um, trying to put uncertainty measures or statistical measures on some geophysical measurements um, and how those relate to decisions. Um, and also looking at um, visualizations and how the visualizations of geophysics um, affects our de uh, decision making as well. But as I said, today's webinar is based um, on a graduate course that I gave for the last three years at MINES. Um, and I would say that this webinar uh, is for geophysicists that are fairly new to geostatistics um, and want to know a bit more about how we go about quantitatively combining different data types. Um, and these algorithms that I'll describe today are um, all the uh, kind of nuts and bolts that you'll see in software such as Petrel. And so this, what I'll describe is hopefully kind of just the real bread and butter of what's been um, geostatisticians have been using, um, not necessarily uh, some of the state of the art that it would have come out in the last uh, few couple of years. So if you're already, um, you consider yourself an expert in the Verigram, Krieging, co-Krieging, or sequential simulation, then I would say um, you won't necessarily um, learn much new here. But I am surprised at how many 
um, geophysicists don't didn't necessarily have the opportunity to get um, some of the basic geostatistics um, knowledge. So hopefully, for those of you looking for that, um, this should be right up your alley. And as Renee said, um, please um, do let us know your questions and we'll go over those um, at the end of the webinar. So how I view statistics um, is that it can help us deal with um, knowledge gaps, which we have many of when we're dealing with a really complex 3D subsurface. So I've borrowed this chart, um, which I'm sure many of you have seen different versions of, where we're showing all the different um, possible geological information that's available to us when we're trying to understand um, the subsurface, where on the y-axis it's showing different levels of resolution of data of the particular data type and then on the x-axis is um, how we can directly use um, or not that information so on the right we have um, data types that uh, necessitate more interpretation uh, or more processing and so as geostatisticians go we kind of tend to lump um, all data types into either what we'll call as primary, which I'm showing here in this uh, purple, or secondary, which is um, in this pink oval. And so here in, in pink, we have probably more spatially exhaustive geophysical data, which is great because we need uh, to, to have a bigger picture of uh, what the, the 3D subsurface looks like but it's not a direct measurement of what the characteristics or properties that we really need to know, which is what more like well logs and core samples give us. That's more the primary data. And in order to build these models, we have to sort of somehow link those two together. And so I'm borrowing this quote um, from uh, Jared Deutsch, who is from a long lineage of geostaticians, and it says, uncertainty arises because of, um, and of course this is right in the way, because of this limited sampling and geological variability at all scales. We fall back on probabilistic tools to quantify uncertainty and generate numerical models of what the spatial distribution of geologic properties might be like. And so with some of these geophysical, or excuse me, geostatistical techniques, we hope to make that connection between um, these this, these two ovals and so that'll be a reoccurring theme throughout this webinar and so that brings me to the outline uh, the first chunk will be describing how do we integrate um, via variograms and so first I'll just Describe the variograms to you if you haven't ever worked with one before and the variograms will allow us um, to really determine the weights um, on uh, some of the data that we have in order to make estimates at locations where we don't have any data. Uh, and then we'll go through some stochastic simulation techniques and that's where we can get many models um, which helps us make some uncertainty measurements. Then I'll finally get to co-grading which allows us to integrate some of this primary and secondary data quanti quantitatively. So we're trying to combine um, some of this really direct um, high resolution data that we don't have very much of with the secondary data, which is giving us a nice broad overview of what the 3D subsurface looks like. The second part um, will have similar themes, but instead of using the variogram, we'll use what's known as a training image, and that will allow us um, to create more geologically realistic shapes. And then we'll talk about secondary data in terms of a soft probability. Lastly, I'll wrap up kind of give you a sense of what some of the directions of state-of-the-art geostats are going in, um, but hopefully just reiterate what the takeaway is, and is that these techniques allow us to reproduce the spatial statistics of that primary data, which is a great um, direct measurement of the subsurface, while adhering to these spatial trends that we see in the secondary data. Again, where um, geophysics is vital for our modeling needs. So let's do a uh, kind of primer on the variogram and how it works. So the variogram is giving us a quantitative measure of the sp spatial dissimilarity or spatial variability. 
And so this is only one, this is one or two equations that I'll be showing. Um, and um, so stick with me as I talk you through it. Uh, but here we are looking at this rock face that we can pretend um, maybe this picture is actually depicting porosity or permeability for us. Uh, and so the Z that I have depicted here, we can use that as uh, a representation of whatever property is of interest for us. And then the U um, is depicting where is that data in space. And so we have what we call the head measurement and the tail measurement. We're look, comparing two um, just two little pieces of data um, at a time. And so in this um, equation you see uh, we're looking at say porosity at one location minus porosity at a distance away from the other data point and then we're going to square that distance. And then what the sum is saying is we're going to do that all over our data. And so what we'll want to do is basically scan which with this little stencil, which I'm representing here in red, we're going to scan through all the possible data that we have. And in this fictitious case, we have this entire rock um, outcrop that we're looking at. And we'll somewhat do an average. We're going to 1 over n um, times 2 uh, to do the average of that squared difference between those data points. And that's what's plotted then here on this lower right. This is what I'm going to start to build up what my variogram is. So at this small little distance h, I've plotted what is that average spatial dissimilarity, where I'm only looking horizontally. We can imagine making that h distance bigger. So now again, I'm going to compare um, one, two, two data points or one data pair at a time and scan that through all the data that I have and calculate what is that average variability if I look at data um, two data points at a time at that distance. We'll see now I've depicted it as having a higher variability because as you would expect kind of looking at this picture, the further you get away from one pixel to the next, they're not going to be um, exactly the same. Again, repeat for a much larger H and again, you're likely going to have um, more dissimilarity when you compare um, those two properties together. Again, we can repeat this, but in a totally different direction. So now I'm going to look vertically. And again, before I even go through this exercise, if we look at this picture, um, what would we expect? We're going to expect that variability is going to increase faster when we're looking um, vertically. And that is, you know, geology 101 when you're looking at vertical beds like this or kind of a layer cake. So again, um, for a certain smaller distance, we'd scan through all the data we have, plot what the average dissimilarity is, and um, indeed we're saying it's, it's much larger. Um, and again, repeat for larger, what you could call templates or stencils throughout your data set. And what you notice is what your, your H gets very large, you're probably having fewer data that actually fit um, that uh, definition of H, that the, the, the distance between those two pairs of, uh, that one pair of data. So here we have two um, sort of beginning variograms um, plotted here where we have um, the distance along the, the x-axis um, and the slimmer dissimilarity along the y. And we've done it for two directions, one horizontal and which is shown in black and one um, for vertical shown in brown. So a typical variogram where you actually um, had maybe more realist realistic data would look um, perhaps something like this. And again, um, the variability is increasing um, as the samples become more dissimilar. And this is usually when the distance between um, two pairs of data uh, is increasing. Um, and so that's what we see um, in this general trend. And just an FYI, there's generally three um, parts to a variogram to describe kind of what its behavior is. The first is the nugget, and that's just saying at a really small distance, how much is your velocity changing or your permeability changing when you compare um, different data points. Um, and then it increases up to here, and you've noticed it's kind of reached this kind of asymptote um, value of dissimilarity, and this is known as the sill. So that's the 
uh, generally the, the most variability that's um, actually within your data set. And the distance at which it hits that uh, maximum variability is known as the range. And so this is saying, well, another um, way to describe the range is the correlation length. So once you are comparing two pair uh, or a pair of data that might be further uh, are separated from each other further than the range, then you can safely say that there's no correlation, no spatial correlation between those data, um, given what your variogram is telling you. And that is the, the, the real use of the variogram is, is telling us, when should I um, think that the surrounding data are gonna help me make a good estimate? Um, well, I'd wanna look at the variogram and see, is there any spatial correlation? Um, given what I see from my variogram. This last little image here is just to remind you that the variogram is an average dissimilarity. And so it's sort of similar um, to a histogram in the sense that you would bin um, some of those dissimilarity values into certain um, lag distances. Uh, and so um, it's kind of analogous uh, to the histogram in that sense in that you'd have to choose what those bin sizes are um, and then and make an average within that bin. This uh, slide is just to give you some in intuition on uh, you know, how you would visually see uh, differences in variograms. And so we'll start with this scenario one. Uh, again, it's to build intuition and hopefully these slides are available to you after um, the webinar. But here we're showing, again, a vertical um, going up and down variogram and the east-west are going um, across in the x-direction. And what you notice, um, hopefully, right away is that the vertical um, direction has a higher sill. So what you should see is there's more um, kind of white noise in the vertical direction than in the east-west. However, um, you should also notice that they both asymptote to their maximum um, variability value at the same distance. And so what that says is that the kind of size of um, the colors uh, that are the same, so these red and blue blobs are about the same um, distance or width and height because um, they have the same spatial correlation both in the vertical and the east-west. If we move to scenario two, we see that what's changed is the range of the vertical. So now um, the height of the blue and the red blobs are much, um, much more narrow. And so that's reflected in this range that has dropped down drastically in the vertical um, variogram. The third scenario is just kind of the, the flip of that. So now um, the larger range of the vertical is showing how there's more um, long continu continuity um, in the, the bodies going vertically versus east-west. And then here in scenario four, um, we have still something similar to scenario two, um, where the range is really small vertically um, uh, ver compared to east-west. However, um, they now have the same sill in both directions. So that kind of noisy feature that you see looking and um, scanning either uh, horizontally or vertically would look about the same. Again, something to just give you some, build some intuition on the vertical or on the variograms and how that um, really quantifies some of the texture that you see in those models. So you can also display uh, a 2D variogram together so that you could exhaustively show what is that variability in all um, degrees of directions. Um, and so here I do that with these two different images of granites. So on the left you have a granite where there's an obvious spatial kind of structure or continuity versus um, the granite that's shown on the right where really it's um, that texture looks all the same in all um, directions. And so uh, the variogram should pick up on that. And so what I'm showing again here uh, in these kind of templates or stencils in pink, green, and red are, you know, possible um, 
are, are just three of many possible directions or 360 degrees actually of um, directions where we would compute what the variability is um, for those directions at that distance. So for example, um, with this, these three little stencils, we would then plot what is that variability in these three locations um, in the 2D variogram. So now um, the magnitude of that um, H distance vector is represented by the magnitude away from the origin, and then the direction itself um, is uh, directly what that direction is um, on this um, basically um, compass. And so we can, of course, repeat this just as before with larger um, templates. And so those would then be plotted further away from the origin. And so the resulting 2D um, variograms look something like this, where that, again, that origin is here right in the middle, where that um, dissimilarity um, or variability is very, um, very low. And then what we see here, the difference between, again, the granite one versus granite two is pretty large in that we have a much lower variability going vertically uh, for this granite that has this vein and this vertical fracture. And so we could, you know, kind of scope out, well, where's the range of the variogram go? Um, it would be some like this oval shape for the, the granite with the, the vein where it would be a circle for the granite that's kind of homogeneously heterogeneous, if you will. So why, again, are, is the variogram so important? Well, typically in the 3D subspace, we don't have exhaustively um, sampled data. Um, and so this little uh, grid here on the left is trying to depict how we do have sparse well measurements um, that give us a direct view into the reservoir. And so what we need to do is determine what are some of these estimates at the unknown locations. And so um, Krieging will use the variogram to make these estimates and the estimates will simply be a weighted average. So we just need to determine how much weight would we put on each data value that we have um, to make an estimate at each one of our unknown um, values. And so suppose in this particular area, we computed our variogram with this data and we found that it had the most continuity um, going, um, trending northwest. And so we can imagine that we're at some, some location that is an unknown within our grid, and that's what this orange uh, square is depicting. And we need to know, okay, if I'm gonna make a weighted average um, as my estimate at this location, how much emphasis should I put on these four neighboring values? Well, what the variogram will say is, well, pick the one that has the highest spatial correlation. And so um, if our variogram is indeed trending northwest, then we would actually use um, the data one and data three more than we would act use data two and data four, even though they are um, and map view closer to this unknown. And so we'd want to plug in the actual um, H distances um, from that to our variogram to figure out which ones um, should give more emphasis. And so um, through this technique, we would then say in this case that we'd actually want to give a higher value um, to data three and the least to data two. And so this gives us essentially the Krieging result. So if we repeated this process at um, every unknown location, um, we get what is known as the Krieging um, estimate or Krieging solution. And so you see it gives a nice smooth um, model of what our property is. Um, and it is showing a nice spatial trend that's consistent with that variogram range that we um, have used. However, there are limitations um, to the Kriegen result. So here uh, I'm showing kind of an example of, um, this is what perhaps are um, the histogram of say the porosity or permeability of whatever this property might be, um, looks like from our direct um, uh, data or our um, primary data. But then you'll notice if you've ever done Krieging and then you check what does the histogram of all of those estimated values look like, 
it looks completely different. Um, so the variance is always going to be reduced with the Kriging model, and um, you'll likely have a different shape. Um, so Kriging does not reproduce your histogram. And then if you actually checked the compared variograms from, again, your um, primary data to the Krieg model, you'll see that the range is much larger because it is producing this really nice, um, smooth uh, <clears throat> estimate. Um, and your sill will then be lower too. So you won't be reproducing the variogram that is of your actual uh, data. So, um, geostatisticians then proposed uh, what's known as sequential simulation. And so it still uses the base um, of Kriging, um, which is, as you've seen, a spatial interpretation method, um, but it gives a very smooth solution. And for those of geophysicists um, who are uh, very excited about uh, least squared solutions and inverse theory, I highly recommend uh, this paper to kind of dive in deeper um, to the comparison of Kriging and to the least squared solution. So it gives a very safe, um, in a statistical sense, um, model, uh, but we want to reproduce um, the statistics that we've seen in our primary data, and that's what sequential simulation will allow us to do. So it will allow us to um, produce many potential models uh, that are all adhering to that primary data that we can have. And um, it, so it generates many multiple, what we call equiprobable um, realizations or just numerical models of the property um, of interest. And so these are actually temperature models um, for a geothermal um, project that I've been working on. And so here we have the Kriging solution that's very smooth. And then here's four um, uh, possible models of that temperature that again, at each one of those um, hard data points where I actually have a temperature measurement, it's um, adhering to the true um, temperature that I have. But um, beyond that, those estimates are different for each model. So I'll go fairly quickly through how, um, how it works. So instead of just taking that true weighted average that the variogram allows us um, to, to get at via Kriging, we're gonna actually use that as the mean of a distribution and then just draw from that mean. And so it, this is no longer the actual estimate, but it's just gonna be a mean. And so here I'm showing um, what is a Gaussian CDF, and it's gonna be centered around whatever we determined um, sh that should be via the Kriging. So this is the Kriging estimate. And so then we use Monte Carlo to do a random draw along this um, estimate. And so that allows us to, um, kind of insert some variability into our, our estimate model. And this will most importantly allow us to reproduce um, our input histogram or the, the primary data histogram. Um, the next thing that makes stochastic simulation work um, is we'll use previous, previously simulated values as known data. So instead of just using that same um, uh, actual data set that we collected in the field. Um, as you're creating your new numerical model or numerical realization, you'll um, consider previously simulated ones as actual data. And this will then ensure that you actually produce your, your variogram. So that can be represented um, in our equation where instead of only using that number of data, as you continue on and simulating, you'll be adding more. Um, to your uh, weighted average. And so just visually to, to depict that, say we're right here in that orange cell in our numerical model. Um, and again, we use the, the nearest data points as far as the variogram goes to actually simulate it. But then for that next location, we'll also use that previously simulated value. Um, so the advantage of stochastic models is that um, we can then kind of um, statistically look at these uh, models in space and have as really what they are is 3D histograms. We can, um, for this case of geothermal, we can look at probabilities of exceeding certain temperature thresholds. Um, so here I'm showing 
um, the probability of exceeding 100, 150, and 200 degrees Celsius in these A, B, and C um, models by looking across all of the 50 realizations that I have. So finally, when we get to the secondary data, how can we pull in um, this more spatially exhaustive data um, into this uh, kind of modeling paradigm? And so again, secondary data is probably the data that you as geophysicists are working with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it can be you know, geophysics or remote sensing from a satellite. It could be you know, some geologic um, information from a geologist, um, uh, either through a cross-section or just um, plain trend information. Uh, and secondary data is super important, um, especially when your primary data is really sparse. Um, and so I'll show some pictures of a AAPG fairly recent paper that um, is using uh, acoustic impedance as their secondary data and well data um, as their primary hard data. And they use this in a um, co-creaking but sequential Gaussian um, framework in order to generate many um, possible models of porosity. And again, in that case, they have only a very limited amount of um, porosity measurements in wells, um, but then they have the more spatially exhaustive acoustic impedance volume. And as you see here, they use um, sequential Gaussian simulation with co-creaking. And so you've seen a little bit of the sequential Gaussian simulation, but now we'll talk about co-creaking. Um, so there's many flavors of co-creaking, um, and they're kind of broken up into um, the first one where um, do you uh, want to go with more of your kind of prior intuition on the area or more let it be data driven as far as um, the mean of data and, and how that's going to affect the estimates that um, you make. The second area is how many secondary points do you want to use for each one of your estimates? Um, and this might, um, there's all sorts of reasons why you might be using one versus the other. Um, and so again, the second equation uh, will get a little bit more complex, but it's still the same thing where we're trying to decide how much weight to put on each data type in order to make an estimate. Um, and in order to do that, we need to have that very gram value. But now we've introduced the secondary data. Um, so how, how do we do that? Um, we'll need cross variograms um, to understand what is the spatial relationship between that primary and secondary data. And so it's uh, very similar um, to as before, where we, um, compare uh, a pair of data or two data points that are separated by a certain um, distance lag. Um, but we would do the same both for the secondary data and also um, a cross variogram where now our um, head value might be from our primary data and our tail value would be from our secondary data. And so um, this can be a lot of work. Um, the picture above gives you a general sense of how usually um, the primary cross variogram and secondary variogram are all related, where the secondary variogram has the least amount of variability, um, which um, should make sense, especially if we're thinking of the secondary data as a geophysical attribute. We generally see um, more smoothly varying attributes. Uh, so just a really quick flavor of um, ordinary full co-creaking. So here we're depicting again the secondary data um, as this gridded pink um, squares and the primary data as purple. And so again, those are more sparse than the secondary data. Um, in ordinary full creaking, again, we would consider all of that secondary data. That's what we're um, showing here in this second part of that equation. We'd actually um, uh, include all of those into um, our estimate. So this would require knowing our cross variograms, which can be tedious uh, to model. And it would also um, require a very large system of equations because we need to do um, kind of 
uh, essentially uh, a matrix um, inversion in order to solve for all these different weights. So depending on your scenario, this might not be ideal. So just something to keep in mind. So that's why oftentimes you'll hear of people using co-located simple co-creating. So they're actually only gonna use um, the secondary data that is closestly located to um, that particular location where you're trying to make an estimate. And so this greatly reduces um, your computation and you actually uh, don't need to model some of your cross variograms. Um, but depending on what kind of property you're modeling, you might be losing some information from the secondary data that um, might be really important. Uh, just a, a nice visual of um, the co-creating, or uh, yes, the, the simulation co-creating result. So here again, they use these primary logs where they did not have very many of them, but again, they were a great actual direct measurement of the, the porosity. Here's their acoustic impedance, um, and then here's their co-simulation of porosity. And again, this would just be one potential model. They could create many, many models um, of, of porosity by combining those two together. Um, and the important takeaway here is that these would then um, adhere to the variograms from that primary data. And so you're getting that nice um, uh, point scale, high resolution variogram information into these um, models that you're making. And again, you can produce many of them and you'll actually uh, reproduce the histogram from these primary logs um, and also their, their variograms, which are important. So now we'll move on to the second um, part of the webinar where instead of using the variogram to create many models and to integrate two different um, data types, we'll be using training images. And so the goal of the training image is to actually recreate more geologic shapes um, that the variogram itself is not capable of making. And so I think the next slide, yes, is usually what I use um, in an eye clicker scenario with my class. Um, and so here's uh, some potential hydrocarbon reservoirs or aquifers where we see um, the alluvial fan, the fluvial um, setting, and a, a beach setting. And given what you've seen about the variogram so far, do you think that you could create these kinds of shapes or patterns um, with the variograms and the algorithms? Um, that we just looked at. Well, hopefully most of you are um, either saying B or C. <laughs> um, but yes, the, the, the point of the variogram is that it's using um, what we call a two-point statistic, right? We're comparing this head um, data value to a tail data value. And so um, because it's just this um, two points, comparing two points, it's not um, capable of uh, reproducing some of those um, what can be called as curvy linear facies bodies. Um, and so these there's three general techniques that have been developed to kind of overcome this. Um, and I'll be just talking about multiple point geostatistics, um, but there are um, other methods that are either more physics based or more statistics based. So the idea is to use um, training images to um, uh, kind of to, to, to say what are some of the, the shapes that I believe exist in the area that I'm trying to model or estimate. And so it's an explicit depiction of, of those shapes. Um, and you can use many of them to kind of represent that you're not certain which shapes might exist. Um, and so here on the right uh, are many potential um, uh, shapes that could be in the subsurface because of the different geologic processes that created the 3D subsurface. And you'll notice that um, they're at very, very widely different scales. Some of them are from thin sections, others are from satellite imagery. Um, and so this training image itself doesn't need to actually be um, constrained to any data. It just needs to represent um, what those the shapes that you think need to be recreated into your modeling. Um, 
Um, so again, it's not a model itself, but just kind of a concept um, so that you can tell an algorithm, you know, I want to create recreate um, some of these kind of hexagonal shapes or um, these other rhombic sort of um, angles. And, and that's what the training image will allow you to do, to talk with the multiple point geostatistic algorithm. So MPS um, allows you to build the reservoir models one gr grid block at a time, um, very similar to what we've already talked about. Um, but now instead of the variogram to help us uh, figure out how much weight to put on neighboring um, data points, we'll be using a training image instead in order to define um, different CDFs or um, to, to draw from in that stochastic simulation um, um, paradigm. And again, that's because the variogram was really just a correlation of two points in space, but by using a training image, um, we'll actually get a, a larger um, um, correlation of many points in space. And so SNESIM is just one of the many that are available. Um, and this is a, a very simplistic view of how the algorithm works, but again, hopefully gives you um, some intuition on it. So first of all, scan, um, the, the algorithm scans the training image uh, with this little green template. Um, and in, while it's scanning, it's capturing all the different shape locations or configurations that it sees in that training image. And then those events within each one of those are, are stored in a search tree. So here we're showing in red um, the uh, four potential shapes that look very similar to each other. Then we go to our simulation grid, we're actually putting in the estimates. Um, and here, let's say we're trying to make an estimate at that center location of this, um, this red square. So we define this data event and we look around that neighborhood in that central node. And we want to search within front our search tree from that training image and see how frequently that pattern existed. So this again is just some example where we're showing um, that for this particular um, pattern, two out of the three times that center node had the black faces in it versus the white. And so we would use a CDF to, di to display these ratios or statistics so that we would say, well, we wanna give um, the white faces a 33% um, frequency and the black a 66%. And so then we'd use the Monte Carlo draw again to draw from that and then um, make that, um, uh, make, uh, fill that estimate value. And so what that's doing is it's going to allow for reproductions of a training image into those numerical models that you have. And here I'm showing an example um, of glacier buried valleys and how um, two different training images were made to, de to depict those glacier buried valleys. And with this algorithm, you're um, able to freeze all the locations of your primary data. In this case, it was lithology information at the well locations, um, and then produce many, many different models um, that are adhering to that training image plus your primary data. You're also able to fill in some geophysics. So we can suppose that we have some resistivity information for this location. And what's the most important step in this in order to pull that secondary information is, is to have some kind of relationship um, that's connecting that resistivity to the lithology that you're trying to um, actually simulate. And so I kind of think of this as my statistical rock physics. And so we can then change that um, geophysical attribute into a soft probability or facies um, probability. And with that, um, there exists a few different types of um, what they kind of probability integration models. The one I'm most familiar with is known as the tau model, and that allows us to combine all these different probabilities from the primary and secondary data, and then allows us to create a facies model that adheres to both. And so uh, I'll start to wrap up. Um, hopefully you've seen from both of these techniques that the goal is to adhere to 
spatial correlation that we believe are in the primary um, that we see in the primary data that's at uh, this more direct high resolution um, scale. And I've hopefully given you some intuition on how stochastic simulation works. It's used both for both the variograms and the training image. Um, and co-creating co-simulation allows us to integrate these two different data types, um, but again, uh, allows you to reproduce the variogram and histogram and to adhere to the primary data spatial correlation that we see. Uh, and then just um, some quick notes on, on where uh, geostatistics has been going. You're, you're not um, only stuck with one secondary va um, variable. Um, there exists many different methods for trying to combine um, some of those uh, multiple secondary variables or see which ones um, contain the most information content. Uh, and I would also uh, highly suggest these different um, geostatistical resources. Um, uh, if you're curious into looking for more, the first one um, is great because it's obviously free. Um, the second one is a great book that uh, I taught for two years with that I really um, enjoyed. And then the last um, is really geared toward um, SGEMS, which is freeware that allows you to do a lot of 3D geophysical or 3D geostatistical modeling. Um, and with that, I think I will end and i um, happy to take some questions. If you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them in the Q&A panel. I also just want to mention that we will have this uh, entire presentation recorded and it will be available on the SEG WNC website. So do we have any questions from those that have called in or tuned in? Nay, I have one, let me. Andrada, go ahead and uh, type your question in for me, please. Okay, I have a question, Whitney. It says, how any realizations is enough? I'm, I'm assuming how many? How many, real, yeah. Um, I was taught to answer that to say, however many you have time to make. <laughs> Um, and that goes to, um, it goes to how big your model is and how big of, how much RAM you have really. Um, but theoretically, the more realizations you have, um, then if you average them all over them, you would get the Kriging, um, the Kriging estimate. So that makes some people happier to know that they have that many realizations. But really, um, I'm very decision driven. So I would say you calculate what is of most interest to you, which is it probability of a certain threshold or is it a variability in a certain area? Um, and just see, you know, by adding more realizations, is that is that particular um statistic or that particular area changing um there's probably um i would say a true statistician because i'm not a statistician but a geostatistician <laughs> um there might be some better um um you know more theoretical answers to that but mine would be very applied and it just, it depends on what are you using these realizations for? What kind of, you know, decision or engineering application do you have? Okay, I've got uh, numerous questions here for you. Um, it says, can you explain again how to deal with multiple secondary data? Yeah, so I didn't really go through that. I just wanted to give you some, um, uh, some what's going on. So, um, 
some, some approaches that people are using. So the first one was a PCA analysis. So um, figuring out, uh, finding some combination of the multiple secondary variables and you know which, uh, what combination of that is really gonna affect it, which ones have um, you know, the most information for you. So you can, you know, find um, those, uh, which would be some, would be a, a combination of the many secondary variables you have. I believe on this website I give you here, they might talk about that approach, um, but they also give their approach, which I um, have not read much into. They call it a super secondary, and I have not looked into that. Um, um, but I believe they do cite some of the papers that take the PCA approach. Um, my student looked into using other stat statistical learning methods like random forest in order to pull in many different secondary variables. And so his um, small SEG abstract is given there. So um, I would say look at those two sources. Okay. Um, next question, what would you recommend besides the resources you shared as the starting point for undergraduate students who want to get started with statistics? Yeah. Oh, with just statistics period? Um, That's what it says. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I like, I, I put these three up here because I really like them. Um, so off the top of my head, I can't come up with other ones, but if you're thinking just statistics as well, um, there is another free, of course, I'm not gonna think of right away, but you're free to email me. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a Python one, and um, I think it's, you know, it's, I'm a doer, so I have, in order to learn, I have to code it up myself, so. Um, there's some nice free Python ebooks out there with um, Jupyter notebooks attached to them. Again, feel free to email me because I'm not going to, I'm blinking on the name right now. Okay, next one is could you make any comment on how robust is, I'm going to butcher this, coke green, <laughs> outliers, or bad measurements? Um, so, coke green won't give you outliers. It's going to give you a really conservative estimate, um, uh, which is fine. In some cases, especially geophysicists, that's what they want. They don't want to pretend that they're seeing things that they're not. Um, so co cooking you won't see any extreme values. With the realizations, you might. Um, but uh, in some cases, that's what you want, right? Because you want to know Where's the high pay zone, et cetera. And so that's why it's important to make as many realizations as you can and then use those to really um, uh, interrogate that 3D space because you really can make a 3D histogram with all of those realizations. Yeah, thanks everyone so much for tuning in. Uh and Shelly for, for fielding those questions. Uh, like she said, if you have any follow-up um, questions or input, feel free to reach out to Shelly um, or Whitney. If you have any other um, comments about the webinars or any future webinars that you'd like to see or know someone that would like to present, please feel free to reach out to myself, uh, renee.richards at bsee.gov or Ming Wong, and we'll be able to uh, provide some more webinars throughout uh, next year and um, continue our um, our effort in, in bringing you uh, great talks from technical as well as soft skills. So thanks so much for everyone uh, for tuning in.